ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय today we will read verse number 20 of chapter 2 of bhagavad gita kindly repeat after me na jayate mriyate va kadachin na jayate mriyate va kadachin nayam bhutva bhavitavan bhuyah अजो नित्य शाश्वत यम पुराण न हन्यते हन्य माने शरीरे न जायते मृयते वा कदाचि नायम भूत्वा भवितवान भूय अजो नित्य शाश्वत यम पुराण न हन्यते हन्य माने शरीरे न जायते मृयते वा कदाचि नायम भूत्वा भवितवान भूय अजो नित्य शाश्वत यम पुराण न हन्यते हन्य माने शरीरे न नेवर जायते टेक्स बर्थ मृयते नेवर डाइज वा either kadachit at any time past present or future na never i am this bhutva came into being bhavita will come to be va or na not भूय और हैज कम टू बी अज अनबॉर्न नित्य इटर्नल शाश्वत परमनेंट अयम दिस पुराण द ओलडस्ट न नेवर हन्यते is killed hanyamane being killed sharire by the body translation by his divine grace ac bhakti vedanta swami shila prabhupad kindly repeat after me for the soul there is never birth nor death nor having once been does he ever cease to be he is unborn eternal ever existing undying and primeval he is not slain when the body is slain ओम ज्ञान तिमिरंद से ज्ञानंजन शलाकय चक्षुरुन्मुल तस्म श्री गुरव नम नमो विष्णुपदाय कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सरस्वती देव गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देशतारिणे जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्रीअद्वैत गदाधर श्रीवासादि गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे हरे 
हरे राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे सो इन दिस श्लोका वी आर टोल्ड द दिस सोल इज इटर्नल इज अनबॉर्न एवर एग्जिस्टिंग अनडाइंग एंड प्राइमिवल फॉर द सोल दर इज नेवर एनी क्वेश्चन ऑफ बर्थ नॉर डेथ एंड वेन द बॉडी इज डिस्ट्रॉयड he is not destroyed he remains as he is <clears throat> therefore the word aja is used the word aja means unborn another name from krishna also is aja krishna the supreme lord is also aja the jeevatma the fragmental part and parcel of the of the supreme lord is also aja but there is a difference both are aja both are unborn both are undying both are primeval both are eternal but the difference is that one is overcome by forgetfulness of his real situation and the other can never be overcome by forgetfulness therefore the supreme lord krishna is also called achyuta achyuta means one who never falls down he is always infallible he is never overcome by forgetfulness that is the meaning of god god is perfect and complete in all circumstances but the individual soul of the jeevatma sometimes is prone to become forgetful because he is covered over by the illusory energy or maya shakti so because he comes under the power of maya therefore he comes under the clutches of birth and death maya shakti is like a cloud that covers the vision of the living entity or the jeevatma we cannot now see krishna we cannot see the supreme lord and we think that we are the controllers and proprietors and enjoyers of this material world when you look up into the sky sometimes you may see a cloud blocking the sun now the cloud how wide is it it can be at the most a few miles wide but can the cloud really block the sun actually the cloud is not blocking the sun because the sun is actually millions of miles or thousands of miles wide so a simple cloud which may be just a few miles wide can never block the sun which is thousands of miles wide what is the cloud blocking the cloud is blocking our eyes the cloud is blocking our vision of the sun the sun is never blocked similarly this maya shakti is blocking our vision of krishna it is not blocking krishna the cloud is overwhelming the individual jeevatmas into forgetfulness but it can never overwhelm the the super the super soul or the supreme lord shri krishna so we should be very clear that at this moment we are all overwhelmed by forgetfulness and therefore we have lost sight of who we are and who god is sometimes when two people fight or argue very strongly with each other and then there becomes a lot of heat in the argument one person may ask the other person who do you think you are huh? have you heard this the other day i was traveling in a train and as you know in the train people are always fighting with each other so they got into an argument and then one person in the heat of the moment he asked the other person apne aap ko kya samajhte ho who do you think you are so actually maybe he didn't realize it but it's one of the most important questions ever asked and ever that can be asked by man but probably he didn't realize it because we are all laboring under so many different illusions now but we don't even know who we really are we are thinking ourselves to be this material body which is simply just a designation it is not the real you and me the real self is the atma as we have seen in so many previous sessions every wednesday here the body is but a tempor- temporary mental construct it is like a dream situation it has no real tangible reality so we should know that because of maya we are forgetting who we are and therefore when somebody tells us about the soul that you are the soul you are part and parcel of krishna we say what is the proof how can i know because maya shakti is so powerful we have even forgotten who we are so what kind of proof can we give people now in the previous sessions we have been discussing some logical evidences isn't it we do have so many evidences from shastra and also by way of logic but there is 
one more understanding that is more important logic has its place but ultimately that is not the reason why we believe that the soul exists in the vedic shastras there has given three kinds of praman or evidences praman means a reason for you to believe something a proof an evidence the first kind of praman is called pratyaksha praman which means direct perception if i say if if you say i have 10 lakh rupees in my pocket i say show me so you take out the 10 lakh rupees from my pocket and show me like you know in this harshad mehta case he said he put so many lakhs of rupees in one suitcase so the press wanted pratyaksha praman they wanted to demonstrate before us so he bought a big suitcase and then he started filling in all the notes and everything so he was trying to demonstrate by pratyaksha praman he brought the biggest suitcase in the market and he tried try to fill it in so obviously pratyaksha praman has its limitations you cannot understand everything by direct perception you cannot see the soul by direct perception just as there are so many things you cannot understand by direct perception for example the sun seems to be just a small little circle in the sky by direct perception but actually we know from science and geography that actually the sun is very very many many thousands of miles wide but because it is 98 million miles far away so it appears to be just a small little disk so it stands to reason that pratyaksha praman is not a very complete and fulfilling proof to understand the reality of something so pratyaksha praman may have its place in our day to day experience but it is not complete it is not fulfilling the second kind of evidence that we can give for the existence of something according to shastra is called anuman praman anuman means inference inference of something you logically infer something i saw something the other day therefore i think that this should be true now hmm? so like this we try to infer logically that is called anuman praman but this anuman praman also has its limitations obviously why because essentially the condition soul in this living world in this material world is subjected to four defects four primary defects the first defect is that he has imperfect senses our eyes our ears our nose our tongue skin sense of touch all our senses are very limited in their ability to understand the environment now we are seeing each other now i am seeing somebody who is situated at the end of the room but i cannot see somebody who is just a few feet away but on the other side of the wall my eyes are limited i need spectacles so it's very is proof that my senses are imperfect we can't hear so many things that are going on outside the dog can hear higher frequencies of sound but we cannot hear them in other words we can of course extend this example more and more but suffice it to say that all our senses are imperfect this is one defect of the conditioned soul the second defect is that he has a tendency to cheat everyone has a tendency to cheat and we know whether it's a big big cheater or a small cheater it doesn't matter everyone has that cheating propensity so thirdly we have a tendency to commit mistakes to err is human as they say and the mistakes will be committed even by the biggest man or the smallest man no no change no difference so we all have a tendency to commit mistakes and the fourth is that we have a tendency to be illusion and the biggest illusion is that we are thinking ourselves to be this temporary material body in the desert if you go also you are illusion sometimes you imagine the water to be where it is not so therefore these four defects are there in every conditioned living entity and so long as these four defects are there we cannot acquire perfect knowledge in this material world therefore pratyaksha praman is of course no doubt very limited but in addition even our anuman praman is limited because ultimately it is based upon our sense perception it is based upon your experience and so long as you have these four defects how can you understand anything correctly you are always going to make defects uh, make mistakes sooner or later so because of these four defects we understand that even the anuman praman is not evidence not real evidence then there is a third kind of evidence that is given in the shastra that is called shabda praman shabda means word word coming from whom coming from the authority we understand that our whole life is built upon faith in some authority for example 
Prabhupada gives the simplest example that when a boy a child is born, he doesn't know who his father is. He simply knows his mother. But he all he has to do is to ask his mother, who is my father? And the mother will point out, here is your father. So the child does not have to go and make a survey of the male population to find out who is his father. Similarly, when we want to gather knowledge, Krishna is the father, the supreme father of all living entities, Aham Bija Pradapita, I am the seed giving father of all living entities. And the scripture is like the mother. So it is said that when the sadhaka, when the spiritual aspirant takes initiation from a bona fide spiritual master, he is actually accepting the spiritual master as a father, as a father being the representative of the real father Krishna. And the scripture he accepts the Vedas as his mother. Because the mother is really guiding him to the father. And points out, because the scripture tells us how to understand who is Guru, how to understand who is Krishna, who is God, how to understand who you are. So it's like the mother. So this is Shabda Praman. We understand from the real authority who is God and who is the soul. And we understand everything about spiritual life on the basis of this spiritual authority. Now it is not something that is new to us. We are doing it all the time. In our everyday experience, we have all the time believing something from an authority. To give a very simple example, how many of us have really seen that Emperor Akbar existed? Or Aurangzeb? Or Maharaja Shivaji? We have never seen him. But we understand from, we have faith in some historians. We have faith in some so-called evidence, some pieces of vase and some artifacts and so on. And therefore some forts and stones and so on. And we believe that yes, Akbar constructed this fort or this cloth, or this archaeological evidence is dating back from the time of Aurangzeb. So we have faith in some archaeologists or some historians or something to have faith. Similarly, we have never been to Greenland or Iceland, but still we believe that these places exist because we have faith in the people who made the atlas. We have faith in some people who show us something on the television screen and say that this is Iceland. So we have some degree of faith in some authority. So there are many reasons we can understand there is need to accept some authority to understand information that is beyond the reach of our senses. Spiritual subject matter by its very nature is beyond the reach of our senses. Therefore we need to accept, we have to take recourse to some higher authority who can give us this information. The first two processes called the Pratyaksha Praman and Anuman Praman are called the Aroha Pantha or the ascending process of acquiring knowledge because you are trying to acquire knowledge by your own limited senses you understand something from here something from here something here something here in this way you try to bring up a, you try to make up a totality of the picture of this universe and try to understand what this whole world is but actually because the whole foundation is is faulty because it is based upon your sense perception which is erroneous which is tent, which is uh, imperfect so your whole structure that you are building up is also imperfect so they are called the ascending path. But the Shabda Brahman or the Shabda Praman is called the descending path. Because you are simply accepting from authority. Whatever authority is giving you, you are accepting. It is not that we blindly accept. But we understand that reason and intelligence, they are limited when we come to the platform of understanding something that is beyond reason and intelligence. So to some extent we will use our reason and intelligence to try to understand in whom we should have faith. To whom we should listen properly. And then we surrender and we understand by the descending process. We simply understand. There is no need for actual research to be done in the matter of understanding what is the truth. The truth is already given in the scripture. We simply have to accept. So the soul you cannot understand by simply trying to make some investigations with microscopes and investigations with so many different kinds of you know, instruments and so on. We simply have to understand by scripture. We have given so many logical evidences in the past few Wednesdays here. But ultimately we should know that this is not the real evidence. These things may help us to be convinced. Because our mind and intelligence is so much immersed in Maya, there is so much doubt in our mind, therefore to some extent these logical evidences, they may help us to get some faith. But the ultimate evidence is the Shabda Praman. The fact that it is given in the scripture. Therefore we believe that the soul exists. So, by our scientific investigations, we can never find out about the soul. The material scientists can never give us information because it is beyond the purview of their instruments and their methodology. For example, it is described in the Shastra. What is the size of the soul? The size of the soul, anyone knows? 
Yes, if you just take the tip of the hair and you cut it into hundred parts, and each one of those parts you cut into further hundred parts, what remains is one ten thousandth of the tip of a hair. That is the dimension of the soul. This is also stated in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Keshagra Shat Bhagasya Shadamsa Shadr Shatmakaha. Jiva Swarupa Sukshmoyam Sankhya Tito Hichit Kanaha. Kana means it is just like a small particle. One ten thousandth of the tip of a hair. Now can we measure this thing with our microscopes and telescopes? We can't do that. It's not possible. And even if it was possible that we had an instrument that was magnifying, had a magnifying power so great, still the soul is a spiritual object. And you cannot see it simply by some microscope. Hmm? So to that person, if he had asked you in the train, if somebody tomorrow asks you on the train and you get into an argument and somebody asks you, who do you think you are? You should say, I'm eternal spirit soul, one ten thousandth of the tip of a hair. And that's all I am. So what is there to be proud of in this world? Sometimes they are very proud. I am this and I am that. So many false designations. But what is our real designation? Actually I am insignificant. I am negligible. I am nothing. One ten thousandth of the tip of a hair. Just see. What is the magnitude of the Jeevatma? So we should know that this kind of information is not available uh, by material scientists because the methodology of getting this information is not available to them. Another thing is the scriptures tell us that the soul is situated in the region of the heart. And seated within the heart, the soul is spreading consciousness all over the body. So this we have seen in the earlier times. So the heart is like the seat, the bench on which, or the chair on which the soul is seated nicely inside the material body. Some time back I made a brief reference to heart transplants. Right? Sometimes people are confused. In the medical colleges they ask me this question very often. That you say the soul is seated in the heart, but then what happens when the heart transplant takes place? We take the heart from somebody else and we put it in this heart because that heart is strong. And that man has died, but he had a strong heart. So we put the heart into this heart, we transplanted that, so what happens to the soul? Anyone can answer this? Yes? Yes, the soul is seated in the region of the heart. So what is the soul really doing? The soul is simply changing its seat, that's all. You see, the, the, the heart from the, the body of the man who died, the soul had already left that body. So there was no question of that soul coming into this body. When you say the body of a person has died, it means the soul had already left. But because the heart was still in good condition, so that heart was taken, and this heart is in a bad condition, so this heart is taken out, the other heart is put, and the soul occupies this. So the scientists and the medical people sometimes they think that I am increasing the duration of life of somebody by transplanting the heart artificially. But no. According to Shastra we understand, what have you done? You have simply changed one part. That's all you have done. Like a car, you have taken out the carburetor from a good car, and you have just changed the carburetor or the radiator, that's all you have done. Or maybe you have changed the seat, you have changed the upholstery, uh, you have got some nice cushions and Dunlop pillow on your seat, that's all you have done with a heart operation. But actually, the person is the same. You cannot prolong the life of any individual even by one fraction of a second. Our lifespan in this world, that is, the time for which the Jeevatma is going to reside within this body is fixed according to our karma, our prarabdha. And we cannot stay for one moment more than that prarabdha decides. Because this material body is made up by superior arrangement. It is made according to the will of God and this body has been given to us as a special arrangement for our karma. So it is not possible that we can prolong our life. When the soul has to leave, it will leave even if the body is in a good condition. And when the soul has to live in this body, it will live even if the heart is weak. So therefore we should know that these are all uh, situations that come about because we don't have the proper understanding of the soul. So we should know that the heart operations that are going on are simply a change of the body. And all this while the uh, soul within the body is steady. It is seated where it is. The yogis, they can actually transfer the soul from this particular body to another body. This is an, a heart transplant. 
but the yogis can actually do a body transplant. Do you know what is a body transplant? Which means they can shift bodies. The atma will move from this body and think that this body is not very nice for me right now, so I want to experience somebody else's body. So he transfers himself to some other body. This is possible for yogis to do. However, the genuine yogi is not interested in such siddhis or such powers. Because he knows that this is not the goal of life. But there are powers that are just available. It is described that the jivatma is actually floating in certain pran, certain kind of life air within the body. The life air in this body is called pran. The life air inside is very subtle. It is not like the air outside. This air outside which is which we are breathing and which is being blown around by this fan is not the same air as the pran within the body. The pran is a very subtle form of air. It is described that there are five principal or primary prans within the body. There is one co- called pran, one is called apan, udana and so on. And they are spread out throughout the body and they are responsible for the functioning of different locations of the body. For example, there is one pran, one kind of vayu, which is responsible for the functioning of the respiratory system. Another kind of pran which is responsible for the functioning of the digestive system and so on and so forth. So the, all these different prans are spread out throughout and they are moving in different directions. And according to the relative balance within the body, one may be healthy or diseased. Just like in the Ayurveda system, they say that the, the body is comprised of three things, kapha, pitta and vayu, isn't it? Vayu, pitta and kapha. So they say basically bile, mucus and air. So whenever there is any uh, maladjustment or imbalance in these three, in the proportion of these three, there is disease. So how does the Ayurvedic doctor cure you? He simply restores the balance of any of these three elements. Similarly, there is something called yogic therapy. By practicing certain asana and pranayam, you see, you can cure the body because the balance of the pranas can be restored. But unfortunately, People mistake this to be the real goal of yoga. So they go to so many yoga classes, they go to do asana, they do go to do pranayam. But what is the real goal of doing all these asanas and pranayams and so on? These two are part of a process of yoga called the Ashtanga Yoga System or the Dhyana Yoga System, which is actually meant for liberating the soul from the entanglement of the prana in the airs in which it is floating. The Jeevatma within the body is floating in these pranas. And it is covered over by them and influenced by them. And the process of Hatha Yoga is meant to liberate the soul from the influence of these pranas. But unfortunately people with a poor fund of knowledge, they go to some yoga, so-called yoga classes and they practice so many asanas, they do so much pranayam with a view to only increase their ability to enjoy sense gratification in this world. Just so that they can become healthy, they have a good strong body and enjoy more of worldly pleasures. They also misguide the people. They say, well, you can do all these things, no problem, but just come, it will cure your diabetes, it will cure this, it will cure that. But the real goal of Hatha Yoga is to liberate the soul from the entanglement of this material atmosphere of the pranas, the pancha prana inside. So however we should know that even though the soul is entangled in these pancha prana, nevertheless, it doesn't mix with them. It doesn't lose its identity. This ex- the how it doesn't mix is given. The example is given uh, in the sh- 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. You see, once upon a time there was a king called King Yadu, very famous king. And he was wandering through the forest and he came, ac- came, came across an Avadhuta Brahman. And Avadhuta is one, a very saintly person who has transcended the material platform, is completely on the liberated platform and he doesn't care for social and worldly rules and regulations. He is beyond all duty. So this Avadhuta was there and King Yadu asked him, uh, it seems that you look like a very uh, aboriginal man, but I know that you are a man of great learning. You are actually a spiritually self-realized soul. So kindly instruct me. Where have you got your learning from? So the Avadhuta Brahman described that I have learnt from 24 gurus. And among these 24 gurus, he listed them. Who are they? The earth the mountains, the sky, the moon, the sea, the ocean, and the elephant, the moth, and so on and so forth. So he listed 24 such gurus. He learned something from each of these items in nature. So what is relevant for us today? 
He said, I have observed the sky. If we see that the wind is blowing the clouds through the sky, the wind is blowing storms through the sky, yet the sky remains unaffected. The sky doesn't mix with all this. The wind will come, the wind will go. The clouds come, the cloud goes. Sometimes it's dusty, sometimes it is clear. But the sky remains unaffected all through it. Although it appears that the sky has become dirty, the sky has become cloudy, the sky has become dusty, the sky has become stormy. But all through this, the sky remains exactly as it is. So the Avdut Brahman told King Yadu, just like that, the soul, although it, it is within this material body, within this panchaprana, within all this material structure, it is subjected to the influence of the three modes, Sattva Guna, Raja Guna and Tamagun. And it is subjected to the influence of time. Nevertheless, the soul is aloof from it all. It is actually, it is always uh, what it is. The properties of the soul are never lost. We have described earlier how the soul is Satchitananda. So the Satchitananda properties of the soul are never lost, even though it is within a material atmosphere. So in this way we can understand that the soul remains Kutastha. Kutastha means steady. It is not changed. But what about the material, material body? The material body is always undergoing change. It is described in the Shastra that the material body undergoes six kinds of material transformations. What are they? Can anyone say? What are the six kinds of material transformations that any material body will undergo? Anyone? Yes? Birth, very good. First one. Second? Yes? Growth, very good. Number three? DK comes later. Also later. No? Yes? Birth, growth, third is maturity. Very correct. Fourth? Production of byproducts. And fifth? DK. And sixth? Death or destruction. Whether you, it is a human body, whether it is the body of a tree, the body of, uh, let us say, an animal. If you analyze it, it is all subject to these six phases. This material body is born in the mother's womb. Then when it comes out of the mother's womb, then it grows for some time. Then it stays, it matures. When it is mature, then it can produce byproducts, children. Then after some time, there is old age, which means the process of decay. And after decay, there is death. So the material body is undergoing all these different transformations. But the soul is kutastha. It remains steady. It is not subject to all these changes. It remains as it is. So the Avati Brahman went on to further explain. He said, this is like the phases of the moon. You know that sometimes it is new moon or no moon. When you can't see the moon at all. And then slowly, it is the first day. And then it's dvitiya, then tritiya. Like that, the third day of the, the, of the uh, waxing moon or the moon gets brighter and brighter. And it goes on like this, till you come to full moon, Purnima. Then again, the moon, st the moon starts waning. And again it comes to the no moon stage. So in this way, from the waxing and the waning, the cycle is going on. This is called the phases of the moon. So the Hindu calendar is based upon, incidentally, the moon calendar, the lunar calendar. And each of these days of the moon, from the uh, new moon to the full moon, is called a Tithi. So you must be knowing that. So therefore, the, uh, the cycle is going on, but all these phases, is the moon actually changing? The moon is not changing, the moon is steady as it is. The moon doesn't change, it is only because of our relative position that we think, oh, the moon is now uh, in the uh, Tritiya, it is Dvitiya, it is Chaturthi and so on and so forth. The phases of the moon, it is Ekadashi, it is Amavasya, whatever it is. We think like this according to our position. But all through the moon is steady. Similarly, out of ignorance, we think that I am all this changing body. We identify ourselves with this changing body. Sometimes boyhood, sometimes childhood, sometimes youth, sometimes middle age, sometimes old age, sometimes dead, sometimes plant, sometimes animal, sometimes human. So we are identifying ourselves with all these different phases of material existence. But actually we are not these things, we are simply the soul which is steady amidst all these different changes. 
Another wonderful example is given in the Srimad Bhagavatam. You see, all these analogies are very useful for us to understand the subject matter. Otherwise, spiritual matters sometimes are very abstract. So in the Shastra, we are given many, many wonderful examples and analogies like this to make our understanding of the subject matter very strong. So another example is given that sometimes if you go to a, a lake and you may see the night sky, the moon is there, the stars are there and when you look into the reflection, if there is a breeze blowing and the water may be quivering, it may be little ripples may be there on the water and because of that the moon appears to be shimmering. Sometimes depending on the speed of the wind, sometimes the moon may become elongated, sometimes the moon may become little shorter, it may become little longer, so the shape of the moon wavers the moon itself appears to be quivering. Hmm? But that is because of the reflection, that is because the water is quivering. It is not that the moon is quivering. Similarly, when you, you know, whenever, when you remember this Mahalakshmi, there is always a fair that goes on. Huh? Every once or twice a year, a mela. And every time in the mela, the children like to go to a particular uh, uh, exhibition where there are these curved mirrors or the convex or concave mirrors. And they look into the mirror and they seem to be 50 feet tall, the long faces and children have a hearty laugh. Or you go to another kind of mirror and you may seem to become round like a ball because the mirror is shaped like that. Again, children are very happy. So in this way, you are neither tall nor thin nor fat. You are just, it is appearing so because of the nature of the surface upon which you are seeing it, the reflection. Similarly, this whole material creation is resting upon desire. And upon the waves of desire, we, uh, we perform activity or karma. And according to our karma, we get suitable bodies. And therefore, according to these bodies, we think, Oh, I am fat, I am thin, I am human, I am plant, I am rich, I am poor, I am this, I am that. But factually, we should understand, I am separate from all of these changes. I am the eternal jivatma. I am the eternal soul. So this is the way to understand the permanence of the Jivatma amidst all these various changes. So these analogies will give us a, a very, very clear understanding. So this material body is nothing but a mental construct. It is like a dream. And when we realize that the soul is eternal, we understand the soul is beyond time. There is no question of past, present, future. The soul is eternal, no question of history. It is only that we fall, come under the dream situation and think that I am so many years old, I am so many years like this, young or old. The material body can produce byproducts and therefore it seems old or young. But the soul, there is no question of a byproduct. The material body when it produces children, we think, oh, these are my children. But factually, these children are not my children. They are different individual jivatmas who according to their karma have taken birth as X, Y, Z children. So the soul, however, is beyond all these temporary relationships. The soul, it remains exactly as it is. So this understanding is very, very important for us. Sometimes people ask, okay, it may be that the soul is not affected by all these changes, that the soul doesn't get entangled. But is the soul not dependent on the body? Because after all, the soul has to live, his soul is living within the body right now. So is the soul not dependent on it? What is the answer? Yes? Yes. Actually, it is the other way around. It is the body that is dependent on the soul. The body is simply a lump of dead matter. But the soul does not depend on the body for its existence because the soul is completely, purely spiritual. It is such ananda. It is not dependent on any material object for its existence. It is only because it is the soul which is covered over by Maya Shakti that the soul thinks or imagines itself to be dependent upon the body. Srila Prabhupada gives a wonderful analogy that a drunkard imagines that if he doesn't get his next glass of liquor, he will die. But has any drunkard died because he didn't get his next glass of liquor? It's a question of conditioning. We think, oh, I need this liquor so much. He pines for it. So when Srila Prabhupada gave this example, there was one person with him, so he asked him a further question. He said, all right, that may, be cure, that may be true of drink, of alcohol, but what about food? Food is necessary for this body. So the soul is dependent upon some material, uh, uh, upon some material object. 
What do you have to say to that? Yes? But in other words, it means that for the soul to remain in the body, you are depending on certain material conditions. You are doing for the body, but the soul is dependent for the, to keep body and soul together. You need to keep certain material conditions fulfilled. In other words, the soul is dependent. That is the argument that he presented. You see, factually, the more we advance in spiritual life, the more we actually begin to realize that I am the soul and not this body. There is a difference between simply theoretical knowledge and actual realization. I may know the whole scripture by heart. I may be able to reproduce all the shlokas from beginning to end. But if I have not realized it, there is no value to all my learning. So somebody who has realized that he is the soul, gradually his dependence upon bodily needs is also minimized, reduced. And this in fact is the experience of every devotee who starts chanting the holy name. The more you come to this process of Krishna consciousness and start practicing by chanting the holy names, particularly the Mahamantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. The more you start chanting the holy names, the more you realize that you are not this material body and that you are actually the spirit soul. And therefore, you become lesser and less, your dependence upon the body becomes lesser and lesser. So we find that devotees are able to give up all the unwanted habits in relation to this material body. Devotees, before they come to Krishna consciousness, sometimes they have many unwanted habits like smoking or drinking or eating meat or doing so many unwanted and unnecessary and harmful things. But once they come to this process of Krishna consciousness, simply by becoming more spiritual, they actually get realization of this truth and therefore they are able to give up more and more of what they perceive to be actual needs of the body. Prabhupada gives another wonderful example. He says just like somebody who is coming from an African country, now he is used to a very warm climate. If he is suddenly to go to the polar regions in the north, he will not be able to tolerate. For him, he is used to a warm climate, so for him he needs extra clothing. A person who comes from a cold climate to India, he cannot tolerate the heat. So it is simply a matter of conditioning. The body is conditioned to a particular environment. So we are used to a certain kind of climate. Similarly for the soul, it is simply a matter of conditioning. Sometimes the soul is conditioned to think that I am a man. Sometimes the soul is conditioned to think I am an animal. So this is all material conditioning based upon maya. Depending upon the nature of our sinful desires, we are given an appropriate body and we are conditioned in different ways, in condition to different degrees and kinds of illusion. This is called maya. But once we come to the spiritual platform, we will understand that we are not this body, so we become free from this conditioning. Brahma Bhuta Prasannatma Na Shochati Na Kamshati Samaha Sarveshu Bhuteshu Mad Bhaktim Lavate Param Lord Krishna explains that when a person becomes situated on the Brahma Bhuta platform, which means when he understands that I am spirit soul and I am not this body, he becomes joyful, Prasannatma. He doesn't hanker, neither does he lament, because he has appreciated and realized that he is a soul. So he has become free from all material conditioning, all material, all bodily considerations. Therefore, he is able to understand his true spiritual needs. There is a great devotee called Raghunath Das Goswami. Now, Raghunath Das Goswami is such an advanced devotee of the Lord that he used to eat, or rather drink. The only thing he would have for his bodily sustenance was just a couple of drops, two or three drops of buttermilk, and that too only once in two or three days. He would sleep only one or two hours every night, and sometimes for days together he would even forget to do that. So for days together he would not sleep. It is not that he became so sickly. Raghunath Das Goswami lived a healthy life and it will interest us to know that he lived for 100 full years. And he was living only on a, just a cup full of buttermilk, just a few drops, and even then he would feel so guilty that I am wasting my time which should be used for Krishna's service. I am wasting simply for my sense gratification. So see, the more you spiritually advance, the more you understand that the needs of the body are artificial. You become free from this bodily conditioning. 
Of course, we should not artificially try to imitate Raghunath Das Goswami. We should try to take what the body actually needs, but regulated way. And then we will come to a spiritual platform. So it means that the soul is not dependent upon the body. The soul is actually independent, and the more we come to the Brahma Bhuta platform, by the process of chanting the holy names, we will be able to realize that. The soul is like the bird, and the body is like a cage. Another example, another analogy. Now, there was once a woman who was only polishing the cage. She did not feed the bird inside. So what happened to the bird inside? She bought a nice golden cage made of pure gold, 22 karat gold, and she kept it there and every day she would clean it. But she would never feed the bird. So what happened to the bird? The bird died. Similarly, we are taking care of this material body so nicely, so many cosmetics and this and that, nice food, nice dangla pillow mattress, nice clothing, nice this, nice that for the body. But what about the soul? So long as the soul is not satisfied, we can never be happy. Just like if you're traveling in a car and you're the driver and you're feeling hungry and I say, wait, wait, and I top up your car with nice 93 octane fuel. And I say, well, I have fed it. I say, well, but you have not fed me. You may have fed my car. Another example. Now these examples are so that we can remember easily. And when you, at least if you forget five, one of them, you'll remember something else at least. And when you meet a friend, you can tell him at least one or two of these examples, even if you forget the other two. So the body is also compared to a dress and the soul is compared to the body. So the body is simply like a dress for the soul. If you are hungry and I come and wash your shirt and say, yes, now you should be satisfied, are you going to be satisfied? So we should understand what is the need of the soul. This is the most important thing that is lacking in, in uh, our material world today, in our modern life. Our whole civilization has been misdirected. It is missing the whole point. The whole point is that you should focus upon the needs of the soul and try to understand how to make the soul happy, then the whole world will become happy. But today we are simply trying to satisfy the needs in the bodily platform and therefore there is so much misery. And people are trying to come to some solution by making so many artificial plans, economic plans, financial plans, technological plans, huh? scientific plans, military plans, peace plans, United Nations, this, that, so many things. But we are missing the whole point. Unless you satisfy the needs of the Atma, there can be no happiness in this world. This is the basis. So it is only in the human form of life that the Atma can actually be equipped or have the ability to fully realize itself. The Atma is actually called Swadrik. Swadrika means self-enlightened. It has the potential to realize itself. The soul has come under Maya, but yet, although it is under Maya, the soul has the potential to realize and come out of this Maya. This is self-enlightened. Because the soul is a part and parcel of the Supreme Lord Krishna. And it shares some part of its glory, of the glory of the Supreme Lord, in very infinitesimal quantity. Therefore, it is possible for the soul to come out of this Maya Shakti. The, another example is given that sometimes you may see a dome made of silver and if you place it in the sun then that dome will glisten, it will shine and glitter. Now it is shining because of the sun. Can you see this, this silver dome glistening in the night? It's not possible. In other words, if the sun was not there, the silver dome would not have glistened. It would, have, it would not have been shining so brightly. But we still understand that had you kept some other object that it would not have sh it would not have glistened like this. What is the meaning? That of course it is glistening because of the sun, but at the same time, that glistening is also partly due to the reflective property of that silver dome itself. Similarly, we should understand, without the grace of the Lord, we cannot understand who we are. At the same time, Apart from the grace of the Lord, we also have that potential within ourselves to want to know. That is desire. That desire has to be awakened. Once the desire is awakened, and by combination of the desire of the living entity and the grace of the Lord, we can come out of this entanglement. And we can understand, who am I? I am not this body. I am the Jivatma. 
So in this way we come to the stage of full illumination, of full knowledge. This is the goal of life. To understand that the Jivatma is actually eternal, that, that I am the eternal spirit soul, I am part and parcel of Krishna, and my goal of life is simply to understand that I am a devotee, a pure devotee of the Lord, and I must now realize this by the process of practicing regulated principles of devotional service. So we will stop here, and uh, I will now have, I think we have about six or seven minutes more, so if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer. Are there any questions? Please make your questions brief and to the point so we can ask, answer many questions. Prabhuji, you said that the soul is not dependent on the body. Yes. But if our body, if we, uh, but if the body does bad karma, then the soul has to go to the hell. And if the, if the body is placed in the, on the, in the service of Krishna, then the soul goes back to Vaikuntha. So uh, the soul is dependent on the body. Means what do you have to say about this? That is the point. It is a question of conditioning, of false conditioning. You imagine that you are dependent on the body. If you realize that you are not the body and you came out of that conditioning, then you are not bound. You are not bound by the law of karma. And then you go back to the kingdom of God for an eternal life. Just like that example of the drunkard. He imagines that I will die without my next bottle of liquor. But actually he is not going to die. If he simply comes to his senses and realizes actually I don't need that liquor to live, then he will become free. Actually, he is not dependent on the liquor, but he thinks himself to be dependent. Similarly, the soul is not actually dependent on the body, but the soul imagines that I am dependent on the body, that I am the body. Huh? This is called Maya. Second question, yes, anyone? Prabhuji, you said about the soul, like we cannot have direct perception, but with our average intelligence, the soul, first of all, we say that it is so small. We know the dimension of the soul. And secondly, we don't know about the shape and size of the soul. So it becomes something slightly very abstract to understand it all day throughout a, to understand, to grasp this concept. Maybe even logically you can understand. To grasp which concept? That we are this soul. Because when you see, like, I can, I can, we can identify, you are this body. You can see yourself in the mirror. You have got a name. The identity comes. When the, if you just talk yourself as a soul, so what is that? That thing of identity is not there. So it becomes difficult to relate yourself as a soul. Actually it is not at all abstract. You see the difference as I explained last time. When the soul is present in the body, you are able to feel sensation. When the soul leaves the body, even if you chop the body to pieces, the body will not complain. So it's caused by the soul. You are now feeling, you are now speaking, thinking, etc., hearing because the soul is present. Other when the soul leaves the body, no question of all these things. So it's not abstract, it's very tangible. So consciousness is present only because of the soul, it is not present in matter. It's that simple. It's not at all abstract. And as far as the dimensions of the soul and all these things, yes, these are not possible for us to understand with our senses. So we have to accept Shabda Praman, as I explained. Accept on the basis of scripture, that this is the uh, location of the soul, this is the size of the soul, and we accept so many detail and so much detailed information about matters which are beyond the purview of our mind and intelligence from the scripture. So some things are abstract, but by process of the, uh, submissively hearing Shabda Brahman from the Shabda Brahman of the scripture, slowly we can understand. Hmm? But yet the soul is a chintya. It is inconceivable to try to understand the soul from a material viewpoint. The sort of, sort of identification is slightly difficult, like here you are totally, when I when I say your name, so I call you as Devamrit Prabhuji. So it is basically on the bodily concept. When I say you soul, so it will be A soul, B soul, X soul, Y soul. So it becomes slightly confusing. You see, way. for practical convenience, we may designate somebody as a, with a label. So these are everyday conveniences by which we designate a particular body. But it doesn't mean that we are that body. All the while, even though we have so many, we have one name, we have a name each, but we should not think that we are that. We may be for the sake of everyday convenience, we call these names, but we are not these names. Huh? Our real identity is that we are the soul. This is just for a matter of practical conduct of daily affairs. Actually we are the soul, we are neither Mr. X or Mr. Y or this body or any other body. We are simply spirit soul.
Yes? Any other questions? Last one question. Hari Bol Prabhuji, you said that uh, life of each and every living entity is uh, decided and according to the Prarabdha. Hmm. Life is, lifetime is decided. So, what is the use of having so many big hospitals and going and taking treatment? And uh, it is like Ugra Karma Prabhupada said, directly go get involved in Krishna's service. Why do so much things? He is a doctor, so he is asking. It's very pertinent. Don't worry, your profession is not being threatened. You can still, you can still practice and be a devotee. You see, in this material world, this is the Kalem, there is going to be distress. Now Lord Krishna is putting us in a particular situation according to our karma, where there is a certain amount of distress and certain amount of pain. Now he is also giving you the intelligence to learn, up, learn how to cope with that. Because this material body is like a vehicle and when it is in, in need of repair, you repair it. You go to a doctor and you get your body repaired just like when your car is, is out of order, you go, go to a mechanic and get it repaired. So the doctor is nothing but a repairer for the body. But ultimately we know that it is not in his hands. The doctor is just a via medium through which your karma may be given to you. If you have helped somebody in times of difficulty, you may try to reduce his distress. If he has helped somebody reduce his distress in the past, he will be helped in turn at this moment when he needs treatment. I think we will carry on the discussion after the darshan. Yes? So we will just briefly answer the last question. You see, although we are not this material body, we are situated in this material body and although it belongs to the Supreme Lord, still we have responsibility for it, to take care of it. We are trustees. So we have to take care of this body for the higher purpose of self-realization. And when this body, there is some problem with it, we have to go and get it serviced and repaired. The doctors are simply instruments through which our karma may be affected to us. Sometimes you may find a person has a disease and even the best doctors in the world can't cure him. Sometimes very simply a disease that has been there for 25 years is not cured by specialists but just by some ordinary person it is just cured. Hmm? I know one person who has had asthma for 25 years, severe asthma. And he tried all kinds of therapies, everything. He went to the, running from pillar to post. He went to one physician after he tried everyone. He tried some homeopathic medicine. He just tried something and it clicked. And he's never had asthma for the last one year. So according to your prarabdha, according to your karma, either you're going to get cured of a particular disease or you're not going to get cured. So the choice, what is the role of the doctor? The role of the doctor is that he has to simply act as a sincere instrument. You can be an instrument to effect that person's karma, to try to relieve him. That is your duty as a doctor. That is one point. The second thing is that a real hospital should be not only a, a place where the body is cured, but a real hospital should be the place where people are also educated and told that, well, we are servicing your body just now to make it fit again, but remember that you are not this body. You are the soul. And the reason for which you have got this disease or this problem is because you identify yourself with this body. So once you become self-realized, you don't have to come to this hospital again. You can go back to the spiritual world. So educate him about why he has to come there in the first place. All these things are a fact of material existence which arise because we identify with the body. When there is spiritual knowledge and we become self-realized, then there will be no more disease once you leave this body. So a real hospital should be a hospital for the body, mind and the soul. Hmm? This is a place which is like a hospital only for the soul. Hmm? Where we talk only about the treatment of the soul, but we do have a medical wing. We do have a doctors who are devotees and who are actually going out and treating the bodies of patients, but they do it in a holistic approach, keeping in mind that the body has to be healthy for the purpose of self-realization. So they do medical care for the body, the mind and the soul. Hare Krishna.